Greetings, I'm Ruth Grimm, Chief Curator and Gary R. Libby Curator of Art here at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach. And I'm here with Mark Messersmith, who is a fine Florida artist who has been painting uh, Florida's interior spaces and the backwoods in a way you have never seen them before. He's been doing this for many years and we're delighted to have your work here in our gallery. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Well, my pleasure. And thank you, Ruth, for inviting me down here. Um, you know, I think you guys have done a great job with installing all these parts and pieces. And I'm really pleased with how it looks. The title of the show is Flora, Fauna, and High Color, The Fantastic Florida Landscapes of Mark Messersmith. It's on view in our Ford Gallery here at MOAS. Uh, Mark, I included High Color in the title for your exhibition because I find that it's uh, very significant the uh, palette you use, you, you hardly use any uh, primary colors. For example, your colors are very almost neon and they're gorgeous. They just bring the viewer in and you want to really experience the painting up close with these uh, strong colors drawing you in. Can you speak a little bit about how you came to use this palette since you came from the Midwest early on many years ago? You know, it's hard to sort of dissect yourself and painters paint you know the way they are and it's accumulation of things they've been interested in things they've seen and I'd be hard-pressed to point to one particular thing about how the colors evolved you know I think you know with the paintings there's so much stuff going on in them and nowadays there are so many colors you can use at your disposal. You know, I just enjoy experimenting, exploring the possibilities of what you can do with these colors one next to the other. Uh, a lot of the painting often is about how your eye perceives light and color, which are sort of the similar but different things. You know, how your eye maybe at one point sees a silhouette and it might be a dark shadow, the next moment that light might overwhelm that object and it almost disappears in the glare. So, so the paintings, I think, in terms of color, are evolved from my interest in, in observing light or, or trying to emulate light with pigment, if that makes any sense. I mean, I, you know, they're, they're two similar but opposite things, I guess, at the same time, light and pigment. Yes, and I've noticed the light is always very important in paintings. Um, and sometimes the light is, you believe that it's coming from the sun, and in this case it possibly is, but then you see the orange reflected on the tree trunks and you realize that it also might be coming from fire. Fire is um, always present in, in, in a good number of your paintings, even if it's just implied in the uh, orange reflection on, on trees and other objects in the, um, in the forest. So uh, that's interesting that you um, have always included the, the concept of uh, light and reflections in your paintings. Well, there's a lot of different light sources and I like the light sources as opportunities for color choices. So, you know, in this painting, you get the, the orange glow from the sun setting so that's one light source. You got the fire coming from the truck as another light source. The headlights coming from trucks and cars as another light source. And the moon coming from another light source. So, you know, in all, almost all the paintings, you're actually staring into either the sun or the moon. You know, you're always looking into it. But um, again, those are opportunities for me to come up with different color solutions based on different light sources. They're so beautiful, Mark, your, your paintings and then all of the wonderful additions you put around the frame, the carved additions, and yet your message in a lot of these paintings is not very beautiful. It's, it's that we are encroaching on the natural environment and destroying it and taking away the habitat for a lot of these, uh, these animals. Can you speak a little bit? You had mentioned once that uh, some of this came from medieval manuscripts. And I found that very interesting. Well, a lot of those medieval manuscripts, you know, they were certainly small and they're books of worship and contemplation. But if you look at some of the beautiful images in them, they are incredibly beautiful with pigments that were incredibly expensive. 
you know, like cobalt blue was more valuable than gold. So the sky was cobalt blue in those little paintings. So it was the idea of these things being as, as in a weird way, intimate and beautiful as they possibly could be. But at the same time, they were always about a narrative that was not very pleasant. You know, some saint having their skin peeled off or, or burned at the stake. I mean, they were always as horrific. I mean, we have movies to compare to horrific things. But if you had never seen that stuff and you look at some crazy world that some artists painted about the apocalypse or the end of time or your favorite saying how they suffered. And at the same time, you had the beauty of these little manuscripts. You know, I, I was always sort of compelled with, with the duality of that, you know, something really, really beautiful. And at the same time, something maybe dark and, and unsettling. And, you know, I think that's the gist of maybe what these paintings in a kind of unconscious way ended up becoming, you know, um, trying to make things that at first glance maybe are bright and beautiful and colorful. And then you look at them again, you go, hmm, you know, everything's not right in, in Florida or the world for that matter. But I don't want them to be a propaganda poster about gloom and doom of the world. Um, I mean, there's better ways to make that message clear to more people. So, um, you know, these are more about getting things off my chest than they are about, you know, converting other people, I guess, at some point. Well, that's just, that, that solves a little bit of that um, enigma for me because um, everybody walks in this gallery and they just go, I, you know, I've heard mm -hmm. so many of our mm -hmm. visitors just, Wow, they're just stunned because they're just well, really that's, beautiful. That's good. That's what I want. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, walls are to be stared at for a second. You know, paintings should be stared at and thought about and, and said and, and looked at and, and decoded by each individual maybe differently. Yes, let's do some decoding. Okay. <laughs> Explain a little bit about the, um, the woodpeckers here that are chained to the uh, telephone pole. You know, some things perhaps should have a complicated explanation and it's easy for me to come up with complicated explanations for things because, you know, I can do that and I enjoy doing that. And, and sometimes the ideas start from relatively simple origins. These are ivory billed woodpeckers and they're 99, 99%, 9% extinct probably, certainly in, in North America. And in the, I guess maybe it was in the 80s, there was a kind of furor over the possibility of spotting a couple of these ivory-billed woodpeckers over in some swampland forests over there in Alabama. So I, I was sort of intrigued by the idea that in spite of the, all the odds, there's still a kind of glimmer of hope that those things are still out there somewhere. Um, and I sort of like that weird sort of sad groping for optimism. But in, in this particular painting, and I don't know if there's any, well, yeah, every, every ivory-billed woodpecker in every painting is wired to the tree. So they were really restricted to certain range, certain type of old growth forest that they could live in. And once those old growth forests had been chopped down, they became extinct. So the idea that a number of animals still can move away from you know, encroachments Others were sort of trapped in their places and, and couldn't really leave. So, you know, and I, and I like birds, you know, and I'm sort of mystified by, you know, these were large birds. I don't know if that's quite life size, but these were large birds. And, and I'm sort of sad about the tragicness of not just ivory bill woodpeckers, but, you know, everything else really. They're just kind of maybe a symbol for that fragileness of things. The fragileness, yes, the ones that you, the title of the painting is those that are left behind. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, so they were left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you talk a little bit about the uh, presence of the painter or reference to earlier landscapes um, that you have included in the painting? Well, this is an open book with an image of Martin Johnson Heed um, landscape, one of the swamps or rivers here in North Florida. And he came to Florida right after the Civil War, came down the train and was working for Mr. Flagler over at the hotel, coming down in the wintertime, and earned his room and board by painting landscapes that were there to decorate the rooms in the hotel. 
and he would come down, you know, in the winter time, and he was a hunter and a fisherman like everybody, I guess, was in those days. And even then, at that point, he was, he wrote an article, I think, for like Field and Stream or really old sporting magazine like that, warning about the idea of, of over hunting these birds for the plumes and, and for their feathers for women's hats. So even at that point, I mean, you can imagine what St. Augustine looked like, you know, like 1870 or something like that, you know, how different it was than it is today. But even at that point, people could see that environment changing, people building and encroaching into the forest and draining the swamp. So, so he's included in there, Audubon's included in there. That's an Audubon um, little postcard. So um, the idea of, of painters documenting this evolutionary, environmentally um, evolving change is maybe what the palette and the paintbrushes are, are referencing. So in a way, you know, we're sort of guilty of maybe being a little too benign. You know, we watch it, we document it, but I guess like most individuals, you feel rel relatively helpless about being able to actually do anything about it. The, same, the paintings seem to be a call to action. Yeah, at least, at least my action. I mean, you know, if I was trying to really do something, I might be a, a environmental lawyer or lobbyist, fundraiser. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a, a painter, so that's, that's the kind of tack that the work has taken is yeah, so you're those using your talents lives. to bring this message and yeah. to remind people to, uh, to value the, the natural world mm -hmm. that we are um, making an effort to destroy as we start to see yeah. fires burning and the civilization and encroaching. But there's always a rainbow. There's always, there's you know, a, yeah. aside from that, I paint things that I like, you know, so I like painting rainbows. You know, it used to be said that, you know, contemporary artists can't paint sunsets and can't paint rainbows because it's been done and it's a little, little cliched. But, uh, you know, who doesn't like rainbows? I mean, I like looking at rainbows. I like painting rainbows. Um, Frederick Church painted some beautiful rainbows in his landscape. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a trope that can be used by an artist, by a painter. So there is hope for the future. Uh, slim, but I don't know. It's getting, it's getting slimmer and slimmer.